So today I'm actually going to be talking about um, starting and contributing to open source projects for beginners. Um, I'm targeting it at people who hasn't contributed to open source or you are thinking about contributing to open source. So I consider myself a beginner. I learned programming maybe one and a half years ago and then I started contributing a year in. So the experiences are still fresh in my head. So I'd like to share them with you. So before that, uh, so yeah, I'm Guo Xiang. Um, I go by the pseudonym of Alan because sometimes when you introduce yourself to people, like when I was spending a year in the States, I go, I'm Guo Xiang, and you get that awkward silence because they can't pronounce your name. So, so yeah, that's my pseudonym. Uh, on the internet, I'm known as um, TJX World. Uh, Twitter is TJX underscore World. So I'm actually a student at the National University of Singapore. So my background is actually in mechanical engineering. Um, but then two years in, I lost interest because everything was just too theoretical. I wasn't building a new Tesla. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, I actually got into programming um, a year ago. Uh, yeah, a year, uh, two years ago, in fact. Uh, so I actually did a one-year internship under this thing called the National um, NUS Overseas College Program where they actually send students into startups um, in California and then you, you work in startups where they have less than 10 employees. So that was my, my first encounter with programming, Ruby, and Ruby on Rails. So um, at Rails conference this year, um, Tenderlove talked about how he got a degree in uh, taught leadering from an online university. So, so even though after he found out that it, his degree wasn't accredited, um, I'm still a big follower. So, so as a follower, I, I tried to do some of the things that he do. So he, he likes to do Friday hugs with his, uh, with his cat, Gobby Puff. So I, I tried that, but I didn't have a cat. So, so I, I, I had to find an uh, exotic short hair cat in Singapore. So there was one in the cat museum, and his name was Brad Pitt. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. His name was Brad Pitt. But the problem was the whole time I was there, he just stayed in that cardboard box and just refused to come out. So after an hour, I got impatient. I tried to take him out, and then when, I, when my hand went in, I got scratched. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm playing Neko Atsume too. So if, if you're not playing it, you should be playing it if you like cats. Uh, so basically, it's a game where you put out toys in your garden. Cats come and play with your toys. They give you fish, and then you use the fish to buy more toys. So you get rare, rare cats to come. <laughs> so I prefer mini test. So if you like... NyanCat, when running a test, jam install mini test dash NyanCat. It's pretty cool. So recently, I accumulated a lot of internet points. Um, I became the number one contributor um, to Ruby on Rails in Singapore. I just thought, like, if I said uh, I'm the 69th contributor to Ruby on Rails, that wouldn't be, like, as impressive. But then the problem was, I, I, I realized that it's the internet. Uh, everything is made up and the points don't matter. So I was like, oh, my all my internet points are pretty useless. Okay, so, so to, the actual, uh, to actual, some actual content. Um, so, I, okay, my talk was like open source projects, but most of my contributions were actually to Ruby on Rails, so most of my examples would be to uh, Rails. So the motivation I had when I first uh, I wanted to contribute to open source was because I was new, I was new to programming, and then um, I really wanted to learn more. Um, basically, like, you do things at work, but then there were a lot of things I still didn't know, so I wanted to expose myself more to other different libraries. And I wanted to give back. So when I got into programming, I was amazed by the open source community. So people like, just put up projects where you can actually use their code, and then it makes you productive. It, uh, it gives you a job. So what I did was actually um, about eight months into programming, I actually applied for Google Summer of Code. And then um, I, w I was lucky to get in. And then um, I actually worked on this project, um, deprecating controller and, and integration tests. Um, but during the whole time, I was actually I was learning more rather than actually completing the project. So actually, at the end of the summer of code, uh, the pull request is up, but it's not no one looks at it. So um, when I first started contributing to Rails, or when I first started programming, everyone was I, I read a lot of articles like Rails is magic. Um, it's this black box which you don't understand. So I was faced with a situation where. I was like, oh no, I have to become a magician just to be able to contribute to Rails. But then as I worked on Rails during Google Summer of Code, I started to realize that that is not the case. Um, reading Rails actually forces you to learn about things that you don't know. Or, or rather, I mean, if you read any good open source libraries in general, it'll force you to learn. So as a beginner, like, you don't know what you don't know. So um, I was exposed to things like metaprogramming. So, like, this is just a snippet, like, define method in Ruby. It's pretty clear, like, it's just defining a method. 
But then I realized there was this whole part of uh, Ruby's meta programming I didn't know. So you should buy this book. <laughs> yeah, but, but so basically, um, if you actually spend time looking into Rails, you, you realize that Rails actually has no magic. It's ultimately it's still Ruby under the hood. If you're, uh, if you're a Ruby programmer, you understand what is going on in Rails. You just need to take, spend some time and try to understand what is going on. Um, so one of the misconceptions I had was like, Rails is such a big code base, like how can I possibly contribute anything like as a beginner? So the simplest thing you can do is actually doc fix. Um, so when I first started, I was just reading like um, the contributing to Rails guides, and then I realized, oh, it could be phrased better uh, in a certain way. So you just submit a pull request. So this is very simple, but then uh, fixing documents actually has uh, impact down the line, like when new develop new develop the developers read the documentation, um, it, it makes their life easier. So the next one is uh, remove all the code. So, so that's the simplest thing you can do in, for Rails. Um, so this is just an example, like we were call, calling routes.select.map, but then in the map, we were just creating a new instance of a route object, and then we, but we were calling flatten, like that flatten was just um, unnecessary, so you just remove it, and then you get one commit into Rails, so one internet point. <laughs> so a bit of, like, um, you could actually improve performance even as a beginner. So, so I was reading through this code, like how a request goes through the whole um, Rails library. So there was this method, like we were calling get routes as heads. So what it was actually doing was basically what you, see, what you saw earlier. For all your get routes, it was actually creating a new route object and just setting the verb to head. So every request, it was doing that. So, but then it was, it was only useful for head requests. So I just, all I did was submit a patch, check that the request method was head, and then you call the method. If not, you don't. So I did some simple like integration, um, a benchmark of integration tests, then you get like 3%, but actually in, in the whole context of a real application, you don't really get much. But then you have to convince someone in the Rails call to merge it, so, so that was the trick I used. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so anyway, um, that fix wasn't still enough, it wasn't enough, because um, on every head request, now you're generating a new route objects every time you call a head request. So what we did was actually, all you, all we did was we set the request method to get, match it against all the routes, and then we set it back to hit, and then you just, and, and that's how you get all your routes for hit request. Um, so one other thing is, when I first started, I was really afraid of showing my code to the world. I was afraid of submitting a bad patch. So my first commit was actually, I opened a pull request on the fork of my Rails repository, and then I tagged a Rails committer inside. So that, that was really unnecessary. Like, in a way, I was afraid to show my code to the whole world. I was afraid of being wrong. So actually, if you just submit the Rails, uh, just submit the pull request to the official like Rails, Rails repository, even if you get it wrong, they will help you. Um, they'll help you with it. And finally, it's really um, it's okay to make mistakes. I, I make a whole bunch of them. Um, so one thing I did was I was reading through all the, uh, the test libraries because I was working on tests. Then, like, require mini test was all over the place. I was like, hmm, we were doing it. We, were, we, are, we are already requiring mini test somewhere else. So why not I just remove them? Then for some reason, it got merged. Then a few days later, someone just submitted a pull request saying, oh, if I do Rails console and I, I type app, mini test is missing. And then I had to get, like, uh, the guy who merged the pull request to, like, revert the commit for me. Yeah, and finally, I, oh, so, so I, got I got it this morning. I just woke up and I was reading through my emails and then I got it. So basically, I recently deprecated um, a science and exert template and I extracted them into a gem. So then this guy just submitted, like, if you actually do it right now, you add the gem to your gem file, it doesn't work. So I was pretty sad. So I said, oh, I'll have to fix this. But then I learned from Juanito yesterday, you just add an emoji. <laughs> Yeah, so, so that, that, uh, the guy hasn't replied, but I, I hope he doesn't <laughs> get the wrong idea. <laughs> and, and finally, sometimes you really have to be patient. Um, many times, like, once you submit the pull request, you're eager for it to get merged. Uh, so I had this incident. Uh, so it was just a pull request on some uh, partitioning of routes. I realized we could do it in setup time. And then I tagged Tenderlove on um, June 20th, 2014. And then, um, so on March... A third of March this year, 2015, finally got merged. So I was like, yay, Aaron merged it. Then I was like, yay, thought leader merging my pull request. 
So I was pretty happy about that. But, 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 but the point I'm trying to make is really um, there's only 13 people in the Rails core team right now that some, sometimes they don't really have uh, the time to look at all pull requests. So it's, it's okay that um, it takes a while. So if you're you interested to find things to work on, like to contribute to open source projects, uh, codetriage.com is pretty good. Uh, you just subscribe your email and then you look, uh, you subscribe to the repository that you, you are interested in committing. And then every day it just sends you an email of different issues that you can work on. And then uh, the, is the Rails issues tracker is pretty good. Um, so this was a simple thing I fixed. It was just like there was this behavior change and then all I did was just a one, uh, like, okay, three lines change. You, were just, you just have to check where the anchor is there. So this commit might be very trivial, but then I realized that you need people with the time to look into it. Like, um, you need to get, uh, read the code base, find out what change you need to add the test. So it all takes time, and we can't expect the Rails core team to be working on this kind of issues all the time. So this is where the community comes in. Uh, so DHH, um, nearing to every release, he'll have a list of things that he wants people to do. So if you look at his issues, so, um, there's actually a, a lot of things to work on. So recently, like I, was, I said, I deprecated a signs and exit template from controller test. That was actually one of the issues. Um, it, it was actually pretty simple. Like you just have to go and fix the Rails internal test case. But then it took me about, say, a week of spare time just to do it. Yep, so, so this was uh, merged recently. And then if you're good with documentation, um, the Ruby documentation project is really uh, good, like 75% um, of Ruby is still like undocumented or not documented well. So this, these are areas where you can actually help uh, Ruby or the Rails community in. Um, so there are a few tools that I think can help you to understand a new code base better. So the first one is actually um, RubyProf. So, so, so I was actually using RubyProf for profiling because I was looking at the performance of controller tests versus integration tests. Um, yeah, but then I realized that um, RubyProf provides you with a pretty nice graph um, HTML printer. Uh, okay, that, ah, I should have checked my slides. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll skip that. Okay, so, so next one is a debugger. Uh, by bug, I think it comes default with um, Rails right now. So if you guys aren't still getting the GIF, it's a bug slide and waving, so it's by bug. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, anyway, so by bug is basically, um, if you don't understand what a method is doing, just raise a debugger, look at the variables, look at what methods are being called, so that's useful. Uh, Rails is pretty well documented, um, just read all the tests, you usually get a good idea of what is going on. So the next part is actually starting open source um, projects. So um, I think the, the most important lesson I learned is really find a simple but yet important project to work on. There, there are plenty of it out there. So the one I found was actually um, a year ago, like Sam made a call for a long-running Ruby benchmark. It was pretty straightforward. We just needed a, a we need to benchmark Ruby on a consistent basis to, to identify um, performance regression. And so I actually started, um, so there were prior work being done on it, but then it was still in pieces. So what I did was actually I put it all together, and then we, we launched Ruby Bench. So the reason why Ruby Bench matters is actually, um, so in Rails 4.1 to 4.2, if you read this blog post, um, Rails actually suffered, like um, there were some performance regressions in there and then Sam went in to fix it. So, but this could all have been avoided if we were just benchmarking Rails on a consistent basis. Like every time before we, re we, we release a new version of Rails, we just have to benchmark it. So um, Sam made this quote, uh, I, I took this quote from Sam, like, basically if you fix a performance regression like months into the development cycle, it's gonna cost more. Whereas if you can identify the regression early and you fix it early, it's actually pretty easy or cheap to fix. So in order to identify performance regression, we actually need a lot of data. And to do that, we always have to be measuring. That's, that's the only way we can get the data. So there are actually uh, ready benchmarks out there. So all our benchmark right now is actually from the Ruby trunk. Ruby trunk has a folder benchmark and we just took everything from there. So Discourse has a, had a, has a benchmark as well. Like we just wanted to see how does a Rails app um, change when, when, when Ruby changes as well. So what we have is releases benchmarks. Um, so this is like a simple, it's benchmarking the URI library over the different releases of Ruby. So, and this is the discourse benchmark. So like in 2.2, you can see that the 75, 90th, and 99 percentiles went down because of the new GC. And then we have per commit benchmark. So this is the one that I'm really actually more excited about. So this was the app URI library. So it's just 
doing a bunch of UI stuff. Uh, but you can actually see like there was a regression. And then when we actually ran backfill all the benchmark, we were able to like easily identify like what commit actually caused the problem. Yep, so the commit was actually a support for a new like a feature, so it actually caused a regression. So the thing is that even though I don't understand Ruby as a beginner, I, I'm not a C programmer, as long as I can help the Ruby core team to narrow down the scope to the exact commit, it's, it's tremendously useful for them, rather than telling them, oh, this is slow, and they don't know why it's slow. Yep, so that's this course on a, on, for every commit of Ruby. And then recently, we actually added um, Rails releases, uh, uh, Rails benchmarks. So we are actually doing micro benchmarks, mainly on active record right now. So if you see like 4.2, your find by methods are faster. And then you can, you can also see that there's a correlation between like why, they, why are they faster, like the total objects allocated is lower. So um, Ruby Bench has different components. Uh, the first one is actually Ruby Bench Web. So that's the whole front end that you see. So the main lesson I learned from that when building the front end was to ask for help. So this was actually a first version of Ruby Bench or Rails Bench back then because I, I just completed the Google Sum of Code. I was, I was in contact with some of the Rails core team members. So I wanted to build something for Rails. I wanted to benchmark Rails for every commit just to avoid all those performance regression. And then we decided to move, move um, into Ruby benchmarks because it was actually a lot easier, like it was the lower hanging fruits. And then we, uh, when it was showed at RailsConf 2015, it was actually showed as like this screenshot. So like my lousy design skill. And finally, so I, I decided, okay, uh, that, that is not nice. So I asked my friend for help. So Yangshun actually, uh, my friend Yangshun actually helped me with it. So we finally have, uh, it look, at, least it, at, at least it looks better now. Yep, so, so the other part is the Ruby bench server. Um, so basically we run all our benchmarks on a dedicated server. We can't run it on virtual host because you can't really guarantee the CPU allocated to it. So we had to buy a dedicated server. When I first started, I was, I was being cheap. Like I'm a student, so I, I can be cheap. Uh, so all I did was I used the soft layer credits, like they give you 500 for your first server in maybe Australia. Then the next month I'll switch to a Paris server and I get $500. So I was using that, but then it wasn't sustainable. So eventually, um, when we launched it, we actually um, asked for help. Yep. So uh, we, we got a lot of um, sponsors um, uh, or people who wanted to sponsor us. And then the, first, the guys that were happy to sponsor us were RubyTune. And finally, we moved it to Ruby Together. We, we just got the guys from RubyTune to, to contribute to Ruby Together. And then now, Ruby Together is actually sponsoring the dedicated server every month. So there's also the Ruby Bench Docker part. So how we run our benchmarks is we run them in Docker containers because uh, we, need, we need to get the benchmarks being run on a consistent environment and Docker is a great tool for it. So the best part of it is I didn't know Docker when I first started the project or I didn't even know about Docker. But then um, Sam like, gave me some directions like, oh, Docker is pretty good for this. And then I looked into it. So building your open source project actually makes you learn as well. Like you, you find out things that are useful for certain areas and then you learn more about them. And finally, we have the Ruby Bench Suite. So it's basically all the benchmark. We actually store them in a repository. So if any one of you wants to contribute a new benchmark, you can just push to it, and then it will automatically be run and then uploaded. Uh, I mean, the results will be on Ruby Bench, the, I mean, the site. So the lesson learned was also to ask for help. So actually, now you're, you're starting to get a picture that I actually didn't do much. I just keep asking people for help. <laughs> so, actually, uh, so I actually asked Chris. Um, Chris is a Rails committer. So he was actually working on Rails Perf. Um, it was sort of like Ruby Bench, but for Rails. But then, so I felt like uh, there was a bit of like duplicated effort involved. So I thought, I, so I reached out to him and asked him, like, hey, would you be interested in like just porting your benchmarks over, and then we can use it for Ruby Bench. So that, that's what he did. And then finally, I think um, the most important lesson that I really learned um, throughout the whole project was to just keep building. Like at the start, when I did Rails Bench and uh, stuff like that, like no one really cared, but then you just keep building and you just keep seeking for feedback. So um, when you seek, seek for feedback, um, you get mentors that are willing to help you. So they'll give you directions and, and you get to learn uh, new stuff. Yep, so that's actually the end. All right, thank you. Hi. Um, is there anything you would like to do next for Revenge? 
Yeah, there's, there's actually a lot of things that's on like, the pipeline that we want to do. So right now, when we run all our benchmarks, the logs are not being sent back to us. So I, actually manu I have to manually go into the server, look at the logs, see like, when a benchmark goes wrong, I have to see why. So ideally, we want them to like, be posted back somehow to the server and, so that we can look at the logs. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of other things. You can go over to like community.rubybench.com. Uh, it's a discourse forum where we are discussing about the new features that we want. So any, any help is welcome, actually. Like, I, I always ask for help, so I don't have to do much after. 